Good morning, everyone. Uh, I think we'll make a start. We've got a uh, few people who've joined in for the Palliative Care Echo this morning. There may be a few people joining as we go along and we'll introduce them as we can. My name is Wayne Naylor. I'm the Director of Nursing at Hospice Waikato and I'm facilitating the ECHO meeting this morning. I'll just uh, do introductions first and then um, go through the agenda for our meeting. So I'll start with uh, everyone who's joining us uh, externally. So um, I'll just go by how people appear on our screen here. So the first one, uh, and we'll, we will um, just so you know, we'll control the muting and unmuting of people. So when we go to you, we'll unmute your uh, microphone from our end. So uh, first of all, Lake Taupo Hospice. Good morning, everyone. Janine here. <laughs> morning, everybody. It's Karen here. Good morning. <laughs> uh, Julia. Hang on just a second while I mute you. Okay. Hi there. Good morning, everybody. My name is Julia Ward. I'm, off. I'm one of the um, ARC CNS nurses. And... Thank you, Julia and Anish. Hi, good morning, everybody. Um, can you hear me? Yep. Um, we are from Ladies Gladstone in Hamilton. Um, and this is Sam. Hello. Good morning. It's good to have you guys. Uh, and then I'll just go around our table here. We can start with you, Tuck, if you like. Hi. <laughs> <Don't fix it. laughs> um, I'm part of the IT admin team. Hi, my name's Adam and I'm also part of the IT team. Brian Ensel, uh, one of the doctors here. Hi, I'm Gail, I'm the care coordinator here. Um, Warren, uh, and we are the education coordinator. I've introduced myself, so good morning. I'm Nolan, I'm the music therapist here. Hi, I'm Catherine. I'm one of the registered nurses working in the rural area. Hi, I'm Charmaine, one of the counsellors. Good morning, my name's Karen O'Reilly and I'm part of the family services team and I'm a social worker. Good morning, my name's Debbie Barham. I'm one of the kinds of key specialists here at Hospice. Great. Can you do the share screen? <coughs> So just a few um, announcements before we get underway. Uh, when we're doing the case presentation, we uh, try to keep it anonymous, so we won't be sharing identifiable patient information and anyone involved in the discussion. If you do know who the patient is, please make sure you don't share any identifiable patient health information. Uh, we are recording today's session and we uh, use these for educational purposes and some of them we post up on our website so that other people can see how a tele-echo clinic runs. Uh, we will be keeping everyone on mute as I said and we'll unmute you uh, when you indicate that you want to speak so you can just give us a bit of a wave if you want to ask a question or make a comment. Um, there's no one on telephone, so don't worry about that. So, and um, just to make it easier for people taking notes, if you can just say who you are before you speak, uh, that would be great. Um, for any doctors who are on the ECHO today, we do have um, CME credits through um, College of GPs. Uh, we collect information on that and let them know. Uh, and anyone else will get a certificate with our hours of continuing professional development as well, and um, they'll be sent out to you. <clears throat> uh, so this is our agenda for today. Uh, we'll shortly get into the short didactic teaching, uh, which today is on music therapy. We have a case presentation um, by Dr. Brian Ensor, uh, and at, during the, or after the case presentation, you will have an opportunity to ask questions and provide comments. Um, and then we aim to finish uh, by 8.30. 
I'll just, because uh, someone else has joined us, ask David to introduce yourself. Good morning, I'm David Wilson. I'm a GP up in Fitianga. I'm glad to hear you got back safely. <laughs> Thank you. Um, okay, so I will hand over to Nolan, who's the music therapist here at Hospice Waikato, uh, to do the presentation. Right. Natato Katoa. Morning, everyone, and welcome along to my presentation this morning. Um, as I've already said, I'm the registered music therapist working here at Hospice Waikato, and today I'm just going to give you a brief overview of what music therapy is and. Um, yeah, who we are as a professional organisation here in New Zealand and then I'll go over how we use music to support our palliative care patients and their whanau and then just look at how we use music particularly in reference to pain management um, as that may be of some use to, to you out there. Um, unfortunately there aren't a lot of us music therapists here in the Waikato just yet but we're working on getting more out into the regions of Aotearoa. So, yeah, we'll get started. So, here are just a few of the different definitions of music therapy. Uh, one here in New Zealand, the American Music Therapy Association and also the Australian. Um, if you have a look at them, you'll see that uh, they all focus on the planned use of music and they're all very very broad and non-specific because we work with such broad populations but the main things to take away are that we are registered um, with an appropriate professional body uh, we have ongoing supervision CPD and adhere to our code of ethics um, internationally the standard is to have a master's level of training here in New Zealand, that's through the New Zealand School of Music, where we have a two-year master's program through Victoria University. Um, and in practice, that means we carry out an assessment of people who are referred to us and then develop goals, which are the focus of our ongoing sessions. Um, and so they can focus on a very broad variety of things, but I'll go into them a bit further on. Um, and in the bottom right there, I just included a quote about music therapists from Claire O'Callaghan in the Oxford textbook of palliative medicine. Um, I just included that because I found it interesting that she used the, how we use therapeutic relationships to address biopsychosocial needs and enhance spiritual well-being. Um, and that immediately made me think of our Te Whare Tapa Whaa that we, lots of us in medicine here in New Zealand use, and um, looking at the tinana, our physical, our whānau, our social, our hiningaro, our psycho, mental, intellectual health, and then our wairua as our spiritual well-being. Um, so music therapy as, a, as an intervention can work within all of those different domains. Um, that's who we are. Um, our areas of practice in New Zealand, we were probably the biggest employers in education, working with um, children with either with special needs or often with autism. Um, the two probably fastest growing areas at the moment are neurological. Um, there's a range of neurological choirs that are going, here in, one here in Hamilton, in Auckland. Uh, Wellington and Christchurch, which have all started up in the last four or five years. Um, if one example of how how that works is working with people who have aphasia. A lot of people with aphasia um, can still sing fluently, even if they can't speak fluently. Um, but those neurological choirs work with people who have a range of different um, diagnoses um, from yeah, dementia and um, traumatic brain injuries to all sorts. So just next, I've got a video that I'd like to show. Um, 
which we at Music Therapy made just last year. Usually I would sing a song or do something like that, but I thought I'd bring our video along because it's only, we've only recently got it going, so I'm not sure that we need to just click on it. Yeah. Music therapy is quite well known around the world now and it's becoming a lot more well known across New Zealand. So the word is getting out there, it's being spread. Music is such an effective tool when you're working with people because there are, there are so many different elements to it but the pressure is off for a lot of people. I work with a lot of people who have issues with communicating and that's a difficulty for them. So if it's a non-verbal way of working with someone, that pressure is gone, they don't have to be able to answer the connections and, and what you work might happen through the music. I think a music therapist has been really rewarding because I've worked with such a wide range of clients. I've worked with people of all ages and I've seen how music can really meet their needs and their needs can be really diverse. So all children are very motivated by music and so even if they have a disability they still have the inherent desire to respond to music. And so it bypasses any need of disability to just that in person's Okay. Our bodies react very positively to them. And if you hear a song that you like and it makes you get up and dance, then it's affecting you. Music is probably, as far as I'm concerned, the most powerful of the arts. Music therapists are registered with the Board of Music Therapy in Zealand. That means that they've all gone through training that covers a really broad spectrum of areas as well as the therapeutic use of music. So we have a background in health and psychology and sociology and things like that which all inform our work. If you're employing or contracting a registered music therapist, you know that they adhere to a code of ethics and standards of practice and you know that they have continuing professional development and that they are um, monitored by the registration board. So there's a real level of safety around that. Um, and just to add on to the end of that video, uh, one of the values of music therapy is that we can respond to the, the unique socio-cultural context that a person lives in or um, uh, their unique demographics. So we, as it said, we can work with people from um, all different ages and from all different works of, walks of life and um, also many different cultures. We can you know, find music from their specific culture and use that as a, as a non-verbal communication tool to, to build a relationship with them, to help them with whatever their goals are, which will step into now. So in palliative care, um, the referrals I receive are often for the symptoms listed up here. Um, and so how we can use music to assist with these. Um, psychosocially, we can help with um, I guess the way it actually works is hard to define without actually talking about specific cases. So you can see the um, fear, anticipatory grief, um, existential distress. Just yesterday I was working with someone who uh, has been having a lot of trouble with their pain. Um, and that's a, a total pain which we have associated with those psychosocial symptoms. So through music we can I was able to go and sing with him and his wife um, and a lot of the music that we use explores those themes of, of fear, of, of death, of um, that ex existential distress. Um, so he was able to sing along with me and, and express that and, and process that and um, his wife was very happy to see when he started to fall asleep after about half an hour because she knew that he was starting to relax and that he felt comfortable enough to, um, that his pain was not bothering him enough that he was able to fall asleep and um, she was able to go home to her children after that. 
Um, obviously, the relaxation that music brings on can assist with those physical symptoms that we talk about. Um, also, singing is very powerful um, as just a physical exercise and um, might have used it to assist people who have shortness of breath um, just in terms of regulating their breathing and yeah, almost having a, the sort of meditative qualities of listening to a rhythm or playing or something rhythmic. Um, so in terms of the, the actual methods that we use, these are the most, most common. Um, and I want to stress the, uh, the importance that we can be playful with people. So we get to not work with the symptoms specifically, but with the actual people and the personality um, that they have, um, which can be very refreshing for people that we're not responding to a specific symptom with a, with a specific tool, but responding to them as individuals and they are having, you know, their agency, our, our process is led by them. So they are able to take charge of, of their care and, and lead us in how that goes. Um, here in the hospice, it can often involve legacy work as well with their families. So we will involve their families and by them sharing their preferred music and their favorite artists or their favorite songs, their family are able to participate in them and, and build those memories of uh, my family member. This was their favorite song. These were their favorite artists. Um, some music therapists will make CDs or, you know, mementos of favorite mu music for them to take away. Um, on Tuesday, I was working with someone, a teenager who was composing his own songs um, about his life and about um, significant parts of his life. And I know that um, his school and his family are very interested in hearing them once they, they will be recorded. Um, and we're working on that at the moment. Um, and besides leaving that legacy for his family and friends, that process of of composing them and discussing all of those issues that have been going on for him for his entire life now um, <coughs> is very healing and very helpful for him just in terms of coming to terms with it. Um, the playing instruments and singing, um, yeah, as I said, it would allow us to be, be playful and be interactive and for people to just live in the moment with us, you know, there's and um, often a lot going on and often a lot of waiting around and you know um being musical is a very 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 active process cognitively so you really need to you need to be there in the moment you need to focus on the rhythm and focus on who, what others in the room are doing and um, so often with children or with families i will get a lot of instruments out and we can all just enjoy being in the room together and um, sometimes I've worked with uh, with small children of of patients um, and the patient themselves may not be able to participate a lot in the playing of instruments but just the joy in seeing their children being musical and experiencing that has, has been really valuable for them um, and singing not everyone likes to sing obviously um, but it is very powerful and also very, very intimate. It's something if you share with anyone who's sung in a choir or who's sung either with others, it is a very intimate space that you, that you come into. They really share themselves with you. Um, and there's, yeah, there is evidence that by playing music live, it is much more effective. Um, and helping to people to relax and helping people to enjoy themselves and, and improving their quality of life. Um, it also, uh, yeah, the receptive methods. Um, so listening to music, just listening to preferred music um, helps to validate people's experiences and offers a place to escape and reflect. Um, it's also allows them to to reminisce and um, 
yeah, I guess bring bring themselves out a bit more. We often you get a referral and you'll see on this list of symptoms and you know where they live and maybe a tiny bit about where they come from. But when they share their musical history with you and what the gigs they've been to over the decades and and well, what instruments they've played or who they've performed with, you get a real sense of who they are and um, you build a real connection with them through that. Um, and yeah, the exploration of lyrics, as I mentioned before, often songs will explore these themes of, of death, of loneliness, of isolation, um, of grief, that are very confronting. Um, but if you explore them through the lyrics, where you know we're talking about the song, we're talking about this thing over here, rather than your direct experience. Um, so it's just a, a way of bringing those things into the room and being able to talk about them. Um, again, just this week I was working with a young boy who uh, has a visual impairment because of a tumour that has affected the optic nerve in his brain. And we were just listening to some songs that he had chosen and there was a line that came up which was um, uh, it was from a Mumford and Sons song that said, take this flesh and fix these eyes. And he asked me to pause the music there and said, oh, that's, he's fix these eyes, that's funny. And he hadn't spoken about his, his visual impairment um, before that. Um, and just by that, that popping up in the lyrics there, we were able to have that conversation about how he was coping with all of that and all of the changes that had happened for him. Um, at home and at school over the last six months since that. Um, and yeah, he had, you know, I've, that was probably the sixth time I'd seen him and he was very shy and quiet at first, but uh, he's definitely come out of his shell now. And um, that was a great example of how music brought that into the room and we were able to have that discussion. Um, yeah. And finally, just music as an adjunct therapy to assist with pain management. Um, so there's research now which shows that the, the pleasure generated by music is the same to the pleasure that we get from food, drug and sexual pleasure. So it works on the same um, dopaminergic and opioid pathways in our brains. Um, so um, this is uh, only quite recent research, but you talk to anybody and they'll tell you about the pleasure that they get from music and how, you know, how it really brightens their day and brings them up. But um, now that we know that it works in those, those same pathways in our brain, we can, I can tell people, you know, I always encourage them to actively use it as, a, as an intervention if they're, if their pain management is, is difficult and um, often they won't think of it when they're in pain, you know, they will, they will know that they get that feeling when they do listen to it, but they won't actively seek it out as an intervention um, at that critical time. So that's, yeah, just encouraging people to, to use music in that way. Um, it's important that it must be meaningful to the patient, so it's got to be it's got to be their music, and that's the same as all of our our music therapy. We're always using music that the patient has chosen and that is meaningful to them. And as I said earlier, there's a good indication that that live music is does have a better response um, than recorded music, but often that is difficult to get. Um, yeah, and so I would just encourage encourage people to, to talk about music as a way, not as an alternative to other therapeutic treatments, but just as a support. So it yeah, may mean that people need to take less medication or um, they are able to, you know, cope in the hours between this dose and the next dose. Yeah. And that's me. All right. Great. Thank you, everybody. Um, yeah. Any questions? Please ask. Yeah. <clears throat> I'll go back to the main view. 
<coughs> so just um, we've got a couple of minutes if anyone did have a question for Nolan about music therapy. Anyone in the joining in sites? No? Okay, we'll come back to our hub team because someone is very enthusiastically <laughs> wanting to ask a question here, Brian. Oh, no, no. Um, uh, just a, a couple of things. Um, so I hadn't heard of the neurological choirs before that. I mean, it sounds like a great idea. How do you get on to who refers, who starts those? I mean, is it Yes, yeah, so the one, well, the first one here in New Zealand was started by Auckland University and the Centre for Brain Research. And the one here in Hamilton is run, well, it was started jointly by Demetra Waikato and Parkinson's, uh, okay. I think somebody else. Yeah. Um, so a lot of this of a traumatic brain injury um, use brain injury in New Zealand and um, the Waikato branch. Okay. So I think those networks. Yeah, those, those networks will, will feed yeah. into that. Because the lung ones are quite well known. So yeah, yeah, ones for like COPD. Yeah. 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 Um, the, uh, the other question, I, I mean, it struck me that most of my interactions with patients, the family mediated through the illness. Um, whereas you actually don't need the illness in a way to interact. Do, do you know what I mean by that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's a good question. When they um, worked in mental health, we often had the d discussion about whether I needed to know the diagnosis yeah, yeah, before I met the person or whether yeah, I needed yeah. to meet the person Funny first. And then, but yeah, obviously to develop the goals, goals that are based on supporting their specific health needs, it is, yeah. is really important to know. And the cross-cultural thing? Yeah, I mean, that obviously depends on the, the therapist as well and um, what our musical abilities are to be able to play different cultural music. But I know um, people will learn, you know, like Middle Eastern scales or you know, different, yeah, non-Western forms of music to, to play with people from different cultures. Um, and yeah, I myself, I like to work with our Māori patients in whānau because I know a lot of our Māori music. Um, yeah. People with English as a second language can find... Yeah, yeah, and that's why, that's why music therapy develops so much in the um, field of autism and working with people who are non-verbal. Yeah, right. Um, because it is a non-verbal way, way of communicating and just engaging people. Um, uh, also with dementia, I work with lots of people with dementia who are non-verbal, but they can still sing and they can still participate in the music yeah. therapy session for an hour, yeah. you know, very comfortably. Whereas it is difficult to, to sit with them or, or engage them in other activities. Do you ever tell people not to play their music because it's bad for them? No, <laughs> never. There have been some, some robust discussions about that. <laughs> but yeah. Generally, if people are responding to it positively, then yeah, go for it. Can I ask one question? Mm -hmm. Quickly. You talked about, is it aphasia? Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, that's when people have difficulty forming language. Yep. But when they sing, it, it flows normally, naturally. Um, I guess my question is, does, does they use different parts of their brain in order to do that? Yeah. Or is it just, they're in the minute and they just, I don't know, you tell me. <laughs> yeah, no, the neurologic music therapy is a really, really fast growing area. Um, and so the best sort of theory we have at the moment is because music uses so many parts of your brain. It's a really global, okay. global cognitive activity. So if one part is damaged, um, you have all those other connections going on that you can get around it. And that's that's the same for for dementia and you know working with people with traumatic brain injuries. That's why we think people are still able to do music when they can't do specific sort of single tasks. And um, we see it with like with Parkinson's, and um, people can dance really smoothly, even when they or they can walk to a rhythm it's fluidly, whereas um, they aren't able to walk fluidly. Otherwise. 
and, and yeah, there are specific techniques that are designed and evidence best to, to support people with those things. And I think there's about maybe 30 now of those neurologic music therapy techniques. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much, Noel. And thanks everyone for the questions here. Um, we're going to move on now to the patient case presentation. Uh, so I'll hand over to Brian to present the case. Thanks, Brian. Uh, thank you. I, um, I uh, visited this woman uh, a month or two ago uh, with Catherine, our rural nurse, and uh, prim primary care has the heart sink patients, the patient that you that visit frequently and you just don't know what to do really. And I experienced a similar sort of emotion um, in this visit, the idea that I'm really not sure how to help this situation. And so I, I bring it to the group for that. It was a referral from the renal team and it's not an uncommon scenario that again, I, it, it sort of merits discussion uh, from a person who's choosing not to have dialysis. And therefore is not followed up by the renal team, therefore needs uh, followed up by somebody else, therefore is uh, uh, put into the, the, the hospices uh, territory and so there's a uh, another discussion uh, as to the appropriateness, appropriateness of that. So uh, the first question is, is the role of the palliative care team uh, uh, in this referral and the, the second question uh, which is perhaps is aimed more at the palliative care team is is that feeling that oh my goodness I don't think I can do anything perhaps we should just admit them and, and uh, use the glories of the inpatient unit to um, uh, do what I can't do in the home. And uh, that's, a, that's a reaction that um, I, I put forward to the objective um, uh, criticism of the team really because I, I'm pretty sure that's not the answer. Um, so the, 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 the background uh, for this woman is that she's 55, as in she's, she's younger than I am, but um, biologically she may be 80 years old. Uh, she has end-stage uh, renal disease, insulin-dependent uh, diet, well she's on insulin uh, with the diabetes, which has really wreaked havoc uh, over her uh, lifetime and she is uh, legally blind and she has a neuropathy uh, to the point where uh, she falls uh, and she injures herself because she doesn't feel the pain. If that's the story that Catherine told me is that she can um, uh, cook and pick up the, the hot pans because it doesn't hurt. Um, uh, She's a, a Maori woman uh, currently living with her daughter, uh, previously in her, in her own house. I'm not sure whether she owned the house, but previously uh, living in her own house uh, with her uh, grandson. I don't know about her own um, social history. It's like, uh, this is what we're presented with. And I put the graph of her creatinine uh, there, so it starts in August last year with a uh, you know it, it, it creating that's up a, a little bit, and it has inexorably rise risen uh, over those uh, five six months up into uh, over a thousand with an eGFR of three, and so I don't think there's anything. Uh, you know, that's caused that in a particular event. It's just that this is 
this is her disease uh, and what's her prognosis and that's part of the palliative care thing. You can just keep drawing a straight line but experience shows that eh, you can't rely on that, you can't rely on that and we'll come back to her. COPD, she's on a number of puffers. The depression is a whole new interest, is a whole interesting part in that she's actually uh, was put up for sectioning at some stage um, uh, because she was depressed but actually not keen on treatment. Uh, she was on citalopram but then somebody did a cardiograph and her QT was 500 so they stopped. David's enjoying that. So they stopped her antidepressant um, and uh, blood pressure. So that's a that was uh, she had a fall or a headache. Went in the hospital. Her blood pressure was two hundred and forty over one hundred and ten. So that's pretty high. Um, we've discussed the falls, the physical um, stuff. Uh, I see a woman uh, in a wheelchair with the big dark glasses on. She's scratching a bit. She's very thin, and that should be weak as an AK uh, and she's, she's, <laughs> she's, that's right. she's, she's weepy. Um, uh, when a caregiver uh, who she's got a great relationship comes, the, the mood changed for her. I don't think, I, uh, the history is very, uh, the, the detail was unclear. I think she's really constipated. She's got diffuse all over pain uh, and uh, it, it's miserable and when she's sore she just has to go to bed. Uh, in terms of advancing disease, more sleepy, um, eating very little but staying on it um, and I think it was just on pen mix. Here's the psychosocial uh, which is limited. Um, uh, the daughter uh, has taken a month off work to care for her mother. Um, uh, there is no money. Um, I remember that uh, somebody wanted to close the door, but actually you couldn't close the door because it was broken. And I, mm. it was, I, it was like, whoa, here we go. Fano scattered throughout the North Island. Um, well, I put a tribe in there. Uh, it's uh, on the way to work this morning. I think actually is that in terms of confidentiality. All we need to know is that she's uh, out of a rojo, she's not in uh, her tribal area, perhaps that's rather than, um, yeah. Uh, it's significantly family died, uh, including a sister, actually did start dialysis and then died. And um, so she's got this history. She's 55, I keep reminding myself. Um, and over years, which I guess go back to that sectioning place, she hasn't wanted to live, she doesn't want her life prolonged and these notes appear and people and um, uh, people put it down but I'm not sure that we're quite getting our head around some of what that means. So I'm not sure that she's depressed, depressed. I think, I think she's just re reacting to her. Um, uh, but there is a there is a discussion about antidepressants and that you know yeah the, the ethical issue um, it comes back a little to uh, so here's a, a, a patient with an uncertain prognosis and a, a non malignancy who has who has a significant needs across the spectrum of her life uh, and uh, and what's the resource uh, that we have to offer in the rural in the rural uh, services uh, we are stretched uh, thinly we have to travel to see these people and when we can't pop in every day and um, and I'm not sure that uh, Nolan can pop in to uh, see somebody uh, uh, an hour and a half away so uh, there are issues uh, regarding that. So that's, that's my case and you can see that I'm not asking for a particular what to do about the pain, I'm asking to um, uh, place her in terms of primary care and specialist uh, palliative care. Thanks Brian. Um, 
I'll just briefly try to summarise the case. I think everyone has the case uh, presentation anyway. So uh, I've noted down, so it's a 55-year-old Māori woman living rurally, um, end-stage renal disease, who's declined dialysis and consequently has no follow-up with the renal team. Also has multiple other comorbidities, diabetes, is blind, has quite severe neuropathy, COPD, hypertension, question about depression, um, currently mainly wheelchair bound by the sounds of it, diffuse pain, constipated, reduced appetite and sleepy, concern around other relatives who've died after starting dialysis, which is uh, interesting, doesn't want her life prolonged because of her previous experiences, um, her prognosis is uncertain, uh, and she has limited family support, but her daughter's taking time off to care for her, which is obviously going to be a financial burden. Mm -hmm. So that's very brief. Does that sound accurate? Yeah. So I'll um, open it up to the um, sites. Particularly David. <laughs> David is waving madly there. Uh, so we'll just go around if anyone has questions. Give us a wave like David has and we'll unmute you and um, go to you. So um, go ahead, David. Thank you so much. Um, bloody hell is all I can say to this one. Um, <laughs> Uh, two things I want to say, really. Uh, you discussed uh, rural uh, environment. Um, I could speak for myself here. I can't speak for other places like Coromandel Town or places like... No, no, Coromandel would be the same. Um, we have a very good social worker here who would uh, move heaven and earth to get this 55-year-old admitted so long as she agreed to it to our community hospital long-term. So your... Um, your workers would not uh, need to come and visit every day. Um, so I think in many cases, rural people are better off again than urban. Um, secondly, coming back to the long QT thing, um, that's the bane of our lives, isn't it? Um, but am I right in thinking that the long QT will give them a problem if they're exercising and stuff? And that's when the heart rate goes up and you get the dysrhythmias. If I am, then it doesn't sound like she's going to be doing much exercise. So if you did feel that antidepressants would help, and I agree with you that that's a moot point, then I would say for a quality of life thing, you start them, as long as she agreed. With me? Thank yeah, you. Thank you. Let's talk before we go any further, I get Wendy to introduce herself. Sorry, we didn't get around to introducing you earlier on. Sorry, no problem. My unmuted, yeah. So, sorry, no problem. I was just a little bit late, had a bit of technical issues to start off with. Um, so, I'm Wendy Carroll, I'm GP in Pyro, um, and just down the road from David, really. Hi. Welcome, Wendy. Hi. Um, my, my comment would be um, like much along the lines of David, really. Uh, this, is, this is a scenario we see from time to time. I wouldn't say regularly, but from time to time. And, uh, and certainly, the, the experience of the the, the, the Māori um, uh, community with dialysis, that, that the comments you make about um, <clears throat> family members having started dialysis and then died quite soon afterwards is, is something that I've seen um, several times. Um, and it is, is a very, um, it's a very challenging um, kind of scenario because we, we do, you spend a lot of time trying to persuade these people that that actually, you know, this treatment is here to help you. And, you know, just because that happened to your whānau member doesn't mean it's going to happen to you. Um, and and this is one of the conversations that I've certainly had several times um, over the years, um, not always successfully. Um, and, and so we're, we're often left with these, these people where you know that, you know, perhaps you could prolong life a little bit further, that you could give them a better quality of life, but, but actually they won't accept um, that, that treatment. Um, and I agree with David that, that we do often have um, uh, rural community solutions that, that help in these situations. And I, and I think that you do need to kind of tap into, you know, what, like what, what's available locally, what can people provide? Um, and, and going back to your original question, like what's the role of the hospice team here? I think that, um, that really in, in this kind of setting, you know, the, the primary care team are really the, 
the lead and we're looking to you for just a bit of help and support sometimes you know like what can we do here can you give us a you know a few days respite care um can you just help us out with you know medications advice that kind of thing but but actually the, the primary care team are probably the people who are going to lead this person's care yeah. thanks wendy did anyone else have any questions about the case or any clarifications? Uh, Lake Taupo Hospice, Janine, Karen, you got any questions? Hi, Janine here. Um, has this lovely lady um, made any discussion about going back to her homeland? Mm. You, you don't know why, why? Uh, uh, no, not uh, not to us. I mean, I, she does have she does have uh, family around, and, and the one thing that she does enjoy are, are, are her moko who are local. Um, and no, she she hasn't talked about shifting up north. No. And, yeah. And I just wondered if any spiritual discussion around <coughs> their cultural, spiritual needs and wanting maybe to be with her sisters. And her sisters might I can't make up that yeah. Um, yeah, so, so, sorry, just to repeat the question from here. Uh, it, it's about have we explored the cultural and spiritual needs um, uh, and that maybe she wants to join her sisters and uh, and the short answer is, uh, is no um, and it's a little bit about uh, whose role is that uh, out of all the people that are visiting this this woman um, yeah yeah as a consultant going first um, first in, um, uh, that's not an area that I uh, touched at all. I, um, you may make it a, a, a central role, though, um, that actually this, the, the spiritual um, pain is actually... Um, as well, um, we ha I have sort of gone there with her a little bit as well, but, but as, which I haven't put in here, she's had a history of abuse and was in an abusive marriage as well, ah. and so that she's quite bitter about that when you do start talking about it it is um quite a big um thing for her so and the daughter when you mention the husband they just say he died six years ago and then they clam up and you can't get any more out of them so it's yeah it's quite he died big. six years ago yeah okay it's, it's on the genogram i've put it up okay yeah. Oh, really abuse, yes. Yeah. yeah, and she's had a history of childhood abuse as well. Right. Mm -hmm. Which, sorry, I should have said earlier, but no, 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 not at all. Oh, yeah, Janine. I, I think this is where having a Kaiofina role mm. is really, really important within services, and that that person would take or the Kaiofina would probably take the lead initially in order to just um, heal the tragedies and um, the, the journey that this person or this family um, are going to go on and who they want to bring with them on that journey. Does that make sense? Absolutely, and it's a recognised hole in our service that we do not have anybody filling. Um, the, the, the glory of, of where this woman lives is that the local medical centre does have a, a community uh, worker who's actually not a trained health professional, uh, uh, but she has huge networks in the community uh, and she has tribal affiliations with this woman and actually she's the lifeline uh, uh, that, we can't, that we can't provide that exists in this rural uh, centre. And um, I learned yesterday that she was out there doing um, uh, ACP discussions. Uh, hey, Waka Kakarauri, or yeah, 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 yeah. Kakarauri, yeah. um, which is uh, developed in Northland for Maori. Yeah. 
but you know, I'm not sure how universal that sort of that sort of person is around rural Waikato. Mm -hmm. Julia, did you want to ask a question? It was just really, um, Julia Ward, yeah, it's just a, a comment um, around advanced care planning, which sometimes makes people's blood run a little bit cold. Um, but I, I attended uh, advanced care planning a couple of weeks ago, and there were two or three social workers there from the renal service from Waikato Hospital. And every, I don't want to sound controversial, but every team and every um, workplace has a has their part to play. And obviously this lady is, has become known to the renal service. So you wonder how much, um, how much was explored with her from the, from the, uh, from the there. And then, and then how did that equate to the referral to hospice? And I completely agree with our, our primary care colleagues. I think this young lady needs to be um, primarily cared for there with our support as needed. But yeah, it's just how the pieces all come together. I find it really fascinating. Yeah, thanks, Julie. I mean, reading the medical notes, you get this, you get this, um, uh, feeling that uh, there's a lot of DNAs in terms of appointments uh, and a lot of uh, people poking interventions at this woman um, with varying success. Here comes David. Uh, yeah, not all helpful. And, and again, and, and so seeing this, uh, I'm not too sure if you call yourself a Kaifina, but this woman. Um, in, in her hometown, uh, uh, going at this woman's pace was really helpful. Um, I don't know when we explore the idea of sort of the community hospital admission, because um, that's a that's a an idea that uh, the pros and cons, I guess, need exploring. Can I ask? Oh. Sorry, over to you, Wayne, to direct. Um, I was just going to, before we come to the hub team, I just wanted to ask Anish if you had any questions from your end. Uh, no. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. Okay, that's all good. So I'll come to the hub team. I know that um, Debbie's been itching to ask a question, so I'll go to her first. And, you know. Thank you. Um, so Debbie here, Doctor. Um, I, I guess I just wanted to comment that often in these situations we, we're responding to our own angst mm -hmm. and the, mm -hmm. the feeling that we don't know how to help or that there's all this unmet need, but I don't yet have a sense for what does this lady expect of us? What does this lady want? You know, we're, we're trying to, exactly your last comment, there, there are lots of things we could do, but many of them are completely inappropriate. Um, so I do think that this this needs to be patient centred care. That's what we do. That's what healthcare should be across the board, but often isn't. You know, the the key thing for me is is who is the right person to truly understand this woman's perspective. Um, and it doesn't sound like that's us. Uh, you know, I think sometimes there's a temptation to refer people to specialist services because we're specialists, but she is a specialist in her not mm -hmm. us. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I think we just have to be careful sometimes that we don't respond to our own need to, to, to be the leaders. Does that, is that a Oh, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, that would, that, we get these referrals because people feel a need and they need to. Yeah, so it, it's that it's healthcare professionals' yeah. need that's being felt, not the patient's need. So you know, what is her expectation or wish for our involvement or anybody's involvement? Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Debbie. And Karen? I can't I mean, answer your question and I won't even try. <laughs> I'm, I'm sitting here thinking, my word, this poor lady. Um, and initially, uh, when David was saying, we've got social workers here who would move heaven and hell to get this woman into care. Um, that may not be what she needs. But what I'm also hearing is that she has someone who has the same tribal affiliation that I, I feel, and I don't know, but I feel that maybe our patient 
has a sense of belonging when she's when she's with this person because in your presentation you said when the support worker is there her mood changes she's happier she's so maybe having someone within her community of the community of her choice who can relate to her tribal affiliation um, and give the patient or our client the sense of belonging and the sense of security of being you know, in, integrated, even at a distance um, to her roots, um, might actually be what she's looking for. And I wonder if we shouldn't be liaising with that person to provide the service, not through her, but to be guided by, because she has the connection, she is connected yeah, to our patient, right. to be guided by what the patient wants. And there's a whole lot of stuff around, you know, I, I refuse treatment because I don't think that I deserve to be safe. There's all that stuff as well. And that comes from childhood sexual abuse, that comes from being abused as a, as a wife and not being able to protect your children. There's a whole raft of stuff around that. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't think we can help that, change that or make that different for her. We have to... If we are going to walk beside her, we actually just have to walk beside her. So I can't answer your question, but all these alarm bells are going off in my head going, whoa, this, and like you say, that's my anxiety about the door that won't close. You know, that's how can people live like that? But this is who she is, and this is the environment she is happiest in, and she's connected to, and she has a sense of belonging. So. We can only be directed by what she yeah. is. So. Yeah. No, sorry, what you were saying, and um, so really having said that and having listened to everything, the picture is not as black as um, we're looking because she does have days where she's happy. Mm -hmm. Yesterday, a visitor, she was happy. She was having a good day. She had no pain. She looked really good. She looked peaceful. The other day we saw, she looked awful. She, she looked crying. Really she was. She looked scruffy. Yeah. Yesterday, she looked completely different. Really? And she said, "I'm having a good day today." Nice. And she can't see, and she stroked my hands, and she says, "You're beautiful." And I thought, "My God!" <laughs> 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 yeah, so there are days, yeah. there are good days, and mm -hmm. I would be asking, "What has occurred in that day yeah. that created yeah. some joy for her?" Mm -hmm. And try to replicate that. Yeah. And it might be that Karina has been in, and that they've spoken about some of those ancestral, tribal sort of connectedness, belongingness, mm -hmm. and that has just light and true spirit. And it was that the family were around, they were just pottering about the house, cleaning up, doing things. The grandson came in, they on the settee he was doing his um, texting. Mm -hmm. And um, and it was just all that, all that thing, her family were there. There was more people there, like the other day, there was, it was a bit angsty the other day, wasn't it? Because we were um, asking lots of questions. But yeah, yesterday was a different day. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. they're asking lots of questions, just, mm -hmm. yeah. And she's probably told a story a hundred times. That's right, but, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, sorry, we're running out of time. Okay. Um, I just wanted to quickly sum up, if I can, the discussion. And I guess actually the key thing that I've picked up from the discussion is that really the care for this woman needs to be primary care led. Um, and uh, the role of hospice is supporting the people in her community to provide care for her. Um, definitely not taking over um, and some of the other points were around um, exploring her spiritual and cultural needs uh, it sounds like there's a good local person who's helping with that which is great so that's the kind of person that we need to be supporting um, and focusing on what her, um, her needs and wishes are in particular seems to be a key message coming across from everyone's discussion um, so thanks everyone for your uh, participation in today's ECHO. Our next one is the 18th of April, same time, same place. Uh, the topic for our didactic then is going to be lymphedema uh, with a palliative care focus to that as well. Um, so Andrew will be contacting you all again with information about our next ECHO and asking if anyone has a case to present. We'd really like to get um, you guys out there thinking about and presenting a case. It doesn't have to be really complicated. 
uh, it could be an interesting case you've had. It could be a challenging case where you need uh, advice and recommendations. Um, but we'd really like to encourage you to think about a uh, patient or resident you've got where you'd like to discuss them to get other people's thoughts um, and present that next time round. So thanks again. Thanks to the Hub team for coming in. Thanks to everyone for joining us early in the morning and I hope you have a really great day and we'll see you next time. Thank <laughs> you.